All right, in this video, we're covering an overview of the integumentary system, which is really just a fancy word for skin. And to start off with, um, very quick recap of anatomy. So your skin is split into really um, two different parts that are legitimately skin, the epidermis and the dermis. Um, the epidermis is actually an epithelial tissue. Uh, we saw that in a previous section. So remember, um, the epidermis really is just um, a stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Right, that is your barrier between you and the outside world. And it actually has um, a surprisingly important set of functions. The first is it's obviously a physical barrier to keep things that are supposed to be inside of you inside and things that are supposed to be outside of you outside. The reason that it works so well at that function is the very exterior of your epidermis isn't even really living tissue. It's just dead cells um, that eventually turn into a very, um, you know, tightly packed layer of a protein called keratin. And we'll see that again eventually. Um, that prevents um, infections because dead tissue is very hard to infect. So as long as you don't get a cut, bacteria, viruses um, stay out and mind their business. It also acts as um, uh, a way to keep hydrated, right? So the exterior layer of keratin is going to get coated with lipids that are secreted in the form of something called sebum, which is just the technical name for the oil um, that's secreted onto the surface of your skin, right? So we keep liquids and molecules out. Um, we keep living things out to prevent infection. Um, that is effectively epidermis, right? The rest of these functions are functions of the dermis. And um, the thermal regulation part of this, if you look, the blood vessels of the dermis play a really big role in this because they can constrict and dilate to decide how much blood gets to the surface. Right? So if you get particularly um, hot and sweaty, you can vasodilate those blood vessels, let more blood to the surface of your skin. That's why skin tends to turn red and look flushed when hot. We're just trying to get that hot blood closer to the surface so that you can exchange that heat, let it go into the surrounding air. Right? Um, mechanoreception is exactly what it sounds like. Um, we're detecting mechanical force. So this is really just a fancy way of saying touch, but... Um, there are multiple types of um, touch receptors that make their way into the dermis, right? Some of them, like these Pacinian corpuscles, are buried deep um, inside the dermis, and they detect uh, more deep pressure um, and even pain um, further down in the skin. Some of them are free nerve endings that wrap around hair follicles. That way you can feel it if something moves the hair around in your skin. Um, others are free nerve endings that get close to the epidermis that detect more fine touch near the surface of the skin. But either way, um, all of those different mechanoreceptors are going to connect to um, a sensory nerve fiber that eventually make their way back to the spinal cord, um, back to the brain, so you can keep track of what part of skin is being touched by what. All right. Metabolic functions, um, your skin is the site of the first step of vitamin D synthesis, and it became famous because it relies on ultraviolet light um, from sunlight in order to happen. And so um, remember, the skin is not just, you know, a sheet of connective tissue that sits there and does nothing. It's very vascular. Um, it's got metabolic functions. Um, that vitamin D um, will eventually go on to the liver and the kidneys to finish the synthesis process. But without step one in the skin, none of that's going to happen. All right. Um, lastly, this idea of skin being a blood reservoir, that really just means that if you're in a pinch, and let's say that you're having a fight or flight response, your sympathetic nervous system is being activated and you're running from a bear or escaping a burning building. You want as much blood as possible to go to your muscles, your brain, your heart. The blood reservoir part means we can constrict these blood vessels, right? Tense them up with smooth muscle and redirect blood away from the skin towards muscles and brains and hearts because obviously they're more critical um, when things get intense. And if your skin is a little short on blood flow for a while, it's not that big of a deal. All right, so let's zoom in and get some more details. The epidermis specifically has a lot of different cell types in it. Um, by far, the majority of those cells we call keratinocytes because they produce that protein, keratin. And most of what you're seeing here, all of these cells that migrate up towards the surface of the skin, those are keratinocytes. Right? And these different layers, um, stratum in Latin really just means layer. So this stratum basal, um, these cells actually are mostly um, 
uh, stem cells, right? So stem cells divide. These cells are going to divide. Half of them are going to start migrating up towards the surface of the skin. Um, the other half are going to turn around and remain stem cells. That way you keep generating new keratinocytes that are going to move upward, but you also don't run out of stem cells. So it's that same pattern over and over again. Divide, half of them move up, half of them stay put. Keep your stem cell population in the stratum basal and keep replacing keratinocytes because as they keep moving up, right, keratinocytes in the stratum spinosum are going to move up and eventually they start dying. Um, so this stratum granulosum got its name because these cells look like they have little granules inside of them. Um, that's actually the cell fragmenting into pieces and starting to die, which sounds horrible, but it's exactly what we want to happen. And as they die, at some point, there's a very, very thin layer that becomes a little bit clear. Under a microscope, it almost looks translucent. So that stratum lucidum, um, because light can pass through it easily. And after that, um, they get dehydrated. And once you're up here, it's pretty much pure keratin. So this stratum corneum is the very exterior of the skin. That's the part that you would actually touch if you touch the surface. And this is entirely non-living, right? These are not living cells. They're basically the dead shells of those keratinocytes that are completely packed full of protein. And again, this is a good thing because if you want to prevent infection, it's very hard for bacteria and viruses to infect a dead tissue Right, And so this works out perfectly. It makes a really good biological barrier to prevent um, infections and other substances from gaining entry into your body. All right, um, other cell types that you would find here, um, melanocytes get their name because they synthesize melanin, which is just skin pigment. Um, everyone has melanocytes and everyone has melanin. There are um, three different possible kinds of melanin. Um, there's brown, red, and yellow. And so if you have um, brown or black hair and relatively darker tan skin, you have brown melanin. If you're blonde, you have yellow melanin. And if, you're, um, if you have red hair, you have red melanin. Um, but they all serve the same general purpose. They're trying to block um, ultraviolet light and protect the lower levels of your skin, right? Because UV light can cause DNA damage. And so this is basically skin cancer prevention. We're trying to block those UV rays using the pigment um, before they get to deeper cells and start damaging DNA, right? So this is why if you go out in the sun for long enough, um, the UV light will tell your melanocytes to start making more melanin. Um, it's a fantastic example of physiological adaptation, right? You get a stress, UV light, that stress stimulates a response that makes you better equipped to handle that stress the next time you see it, right? The next time you're out in the sun. All right, Langerhans cells, um, these are effectively the immune cells of um, the epidermis. They act like macrophages, um, same idea as the macrophages that we saw in connective tissues. They're just scanning for infection, um, looking for any bacteria or viruses that may have happened to get through um, the upper layer of the epidermis. All right, and then lastly, Merkel cells. Um, these are um, sensory receptors. These are touch receptors that detect fine touch they connect to sensory neurons exactly like those um, sensory neurons that we just saw in the overview of the skin previously, just another subcategory of sensory receptor. Okay, so histology. This is what um, a section of skin looks like under a microscope. Um, everything down here is dermis. Everything up here is epidermis. These structures that you see here that almost look like teeth connecting like in a zipper between the epidermis and the dermis. Um, those are called papilla. And so this region up here, we call the papillary layer. The purpose of that is you're just increasing the surface area between the dermis and the epidermis um, to make it harder for them to separate and peel apart. If you ever get a blister um, and you get a little bit of fluid building up inside the blister, that is the epidermis and the dermis peeling apart from each other and the liquid builds up in the gap that forms. So these papilla lock together to try to make a stronger connection, hopefully prevent that from happening. Right. This particular layer down here, this is dense, regular connective tissue, and it is almost entirely made of collagen. A um, little bit of elastin too, because your skin has some stretch and recoil properties to it, but primarily um, connective tissue. 
And now embedded in that connective tissue, um, you're going to find things like sensory receptors and sweat glands, sebaceous glands, hair follicles. Um, we can't see any of those things in this exact section, but they are going to show up here pretty soon. Okay, so sweat glands as an example. Um, in this section of skin, this entire structure is a sweat gland. If you zoom in close, notice how it's made up of a bunch of tiny little circular structures. Um, those structures are coils of the sweat gland duct, kind of like if you took a bendy straw and you wound it up into a ball. Um, when we slice this in two dimensions, we're just seeing different portions of where that little tube or straw was cut, right? And then if you follow this guy, you can't see the entire thing, but that little trace of structure is going up towards the surface. Uh, that's the duct where the sweat gland would make its way up to the epidermis, right? And eventually secrete sweat um, out onto the surface to dissipate heat, right? So we're making the fluid down in the sweat gland, exporting it up this tube. This is a great example of an exocrine gland that we talked about back in um, the video on epithelial tissues, right? So it gives you an example of how you can find many tissue types in one organ. This is all dense um, irregular connective tissue. Um, these cells lining the tubes of the sweat gland, those would be cuboidal epithelial cells, right? This epidermis up top is a stratified squamous epithelium, right? Skin is a complex organ. You've got many different tissue types that you find inside of it. All right. Subtypes, um, eccrine glands are the vast majority of sweat glands in the body. They're mostly producing just watery sweat that is used for dissipating heat and that's fairly straightforward. They're getting that liquid from drawing um, the interstitial fluid, meaning the fluid surrounding cells from the skin. Apocrine sweat glands, on the other hand, a um, little bit of a different beast. Those are only found in axillary regions, which uh, medical terminology, axillary means armpit, and um, genital regions. This is more of a, a slightly oily or greasy sweat. Um, it's known for um, containing pheromones that come with it. So disgusting as it might be, there's pretty good evidence that humans have some sort of chemical signaling to each other. And we don't really consciously detect pheromones, but there's some very strange and odd scientific evidence that those pheromones can impact the way that people behave. Um, and that's a subject for another lecture, but those apocrine sweat secretions are where you would find them. Okay, so... This is a closer, more zoomed in look. Um, these are those epithelial cells that I said are actually secreting sweat. This would be the lumen of the duct, right, of the sweat gland. And so each one of these rings of cells is one leg of the sweat gland. And if this was three dimensional, you could imagine those tubes coming out of the screen and folding back over to connect to each other, right, like a ball, um, like a garden hose that's all coiled up on top of itself. Okay, so when you draw the fluid out, we're taking liquid from all of this surrounding tissue, drawing it into those cells, excreting it into the lumen, and then that fluid travels up the duct to the sweat gland to find its way to the surface of the skin and to avoid um, losing valuable salts, things like sodium and potassium and chloride, as much as possible, um, we try to extract some of those salts and keep them in the body. Um, otherwise, right, dietary salt intake would have to go up, and so it's a conservation kind of thing. Okay. Um, sebaceous glands. So more exocrine glands found in the skin. Um, sebaceous glands are glands that secrete the oil or sebum onto the surface of the skin. And for the most part, they're connected to hair follicles, right? So this is the hair canal. You can't see it here, but the actual shaft of the hair would be inside that space, right? And the surface of the skin would be like in front of your screen right now. And so the hair is almost coming out of the screen at us. These cells in the sebaceous gland, right, this is a holocrine gland, these cells actually die and break off, and the fragments of those cells are secreted through this little duct into the hair canal. The purpose is, one, it creates a lubricant um, so that the hair can slide up the hair canal and get out the surface. And once you make it to the skin, um, this is waterproofing, right? Oil and water don't mix. And so if you coat the surface of the skin with oil, Right? It keeps water trapped inside of your body so that you don't dehydrate as easily. Um, also keeps water-soluble substances that you might you know, expose to your skin from getting inside of you. Um, also some mild antibacterial properties, um, discouraging the growth of you know, any bacteria that might be pathogenic. All right, 
Same general concept exists in ceremonious glands, which produce earwax. They're only found in the ears. It's the same idea, just a much denser, thicker, waxier secretion instead of the oil like on the skin. And um, a lot of people always wonder, what's the point of having earwax? Um, best guesses, um, disgusting as it may be, um, we're trying to keep parasites out of the ear. Um, insects, especially while you sleep, can crawl in the ear canal um, and they're less likely to want to try to make that adventure if there's a bunch of sticky earwax to get through. All right. Okay, so hair follicles. Um, this is fairly straightforward. Um, the hair is being generated by a cluster of dividing cells in this hair bulb, which is the root of the hair. Um, it usually sits either deep in the dermis or even down into the adipose tissue, right in subcutaneous fat. And the hair matrix is where cells are dividing. And this looks an awful lot like the epidermis, right? You've got a cluster of stem cells down here that divide. Those cells move up and eventually die and turn into keratin, right? So that the hair shaft up here is made of keratin exactly like the stratum corneum in the epidermis is. Just different arrangements. So we get a slightly different shaped structure, but same protein. Right? And in order to make that happen, you have to have blood supply. So this hair papilla on the bottom, that's just the blood vessels that are feeding nutrients um, to those dividing cells, allowing them to keep reproducing. Okay, fingernails. Again, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. The anatomy is fairly straightforward. All I'll say is the nail root back here, same exact thing. You have stem cells back here that are going through cell division they're migrating this way. Um, and the actual body of the nail, also made of keratin, exactly like hair and the stratum corneum and the epidermis is, we're just packing it more densely. And so you'll see keratin is pretty uh, versatile protein. If you keep packing it um, tighter and tighter, you get thicker, harder structures. Um, even a rhinoceros's horn is made of keratin, um, just on a very, very large scale um, of compacting as much of it together as you possibly can.